Hi, this is Silvia Mazzoni and welcome back to my videos. Today I'm going to talk about the transformation command in OpenSeas. I have it here from the OpenSeas wiki for the Tickle version and I have here a little excerpt from the OpenSeas Pi documentation. The format is the same so I'm going to go with the OpenSeas wiki page only because it's got more figures, a little bit cleaner to read the text and plus because I wrote it. Here's a link to where you can find this information. Here you see it literally for the linear transformation command, but I'm going to talk about it in more general terms. What the transformation command does is it does certain transformation operations on the element stiffness matrix right before it puts these components into the global stiffness matrix. There's three different things that it does. One is it gives the type of transformation to perform, whether you do a linear transformation, which is just a basic transformation, whether you do a P-delta transformation, which means you turn on the effects due to P-delta, and you can also do a correlational transformation, which tells it to compute the equilibrium in the deform configuration. I'm gonna focus on the linear transformation and everything else on the other parameters apply to the other transformations as well. The tag is just a way to identify it. And then the other two things that you do in the transformation command is one is you define the transformation from the local to the global coordinate axes. This can be tricky and I'm going to go through in detail here how that would be done. And then the other thing that it does is you define any sort of rigid offsets within the element ends of the flexible end to the actual node locations. This is really handy because it's rigid offsets. You don't have to put in these additional element with really high stiffness values that can cause you some problems. You don't have to use any sort of equal DOF. The joint offset command really helps in, you know, even just doing joint offset or maybe you have an offset of your hinge. I'm not going to go in through that. I'm actually going to focus on the definition of this vector called vector X is Z, and it has three components in the X, the Y, and the Z. As you can see, these are in the global coordinates. And what this is going to do is you need to define the orientation of your local Z axes as well as your local Y axes with respect to global coordinates. The local X axis is defined by definition as the direction that connects node I and node J. So you go from node I to node J, there's your local X coordinate. So it's pretty much the axes that's longitudinal to your element. This is really important because this is used in defining the orientation of the other axes. And remember, we always have to obey the right-hand rule. So what do we do? Well, let's read the instructions here, and then we can go from there. The X, Y, and Z, and so you can see these are, as I said, in the global coordinates of this vector X, Z. So it's not the vector Z. It's a vector that is in the xz plane, lowercase xz, which means in the local coordinate system, and of course the x is the local longitudinal axis of the local coordinate system. The local y is defined by taking the cross product of this vector, and then, so what the program does is actually is, you, you define this vex xz, it's gonna cross it with the local x axis vector, and that gives it, so let's say you've got this vex xz coming this way. Okay, and we're just in some random plane here, in random space. So what it's going to do is going to take the X cross product of this vector with this local X vector. They don't have to be perpendicular to each other. This can have any sort of angle that is not equal to zero, pretty much. It could be 90 degrees, but it could even be 45 degrees. It doesn't really matter as long as it has a component that is orthogonal to the local x-axis. What the program will then do is it's going to take this random vector. So let's say we're going to, just to kind of make it look a little bit better. So let's make it look like it's pretty shallow, okay? So this is my xz vector, and this is my alpha. What the program will do is going to cross xz, cross x, is going to give the local y-axis. And so this is going to give 90 degrees by definition of the cross product. So here's my local y axes in global coordinates. What now the program will then do as a second step is going to take x, local x, cross it with y, and it's going to compute this local z axis vector, which is 90 degrees from both of them. So this is how it's going to define these three vectors or these two additional vectors by just using this one individual vector that does not have to be orthogonal to the local x axis but it definitely cannot be parallel to it because you can't take the cross product of a parallel 
of two parallel vectors. So that's all you have to define. You don't have to define the actual direction of your x-axis or your z-axis. You only have to define, you know, a vector in that plane. So let's see how we can do that. If you scroll down a little bit, you've got pretty much the concept that I mentioned before about Euclidean geometry and how you can define a plane by just two vectors that don't have to be orthogonal to each other. We've resolved that whole issue there. Now, this is how the coordinate system is specified. The x-axis is a vector given by the two element nodes. So I'm literally going to repeat what I just went through, right? So here's your node i, node j, and therefore my x-axis is going to be right there. So there's my local x-axis. Then the vector xz is a vector the user specifies that must not be parallel to the x-axis. The x-axis along with the vec xz vector define the xz plane. So here's my xz vector right there, and it's not perpendicular, but it's at an angle alpha. Anything you want to specify it from the i-axis. Typically, it's just easier oftentimes to define things at a, at a different angle or at an orthogonal angle, but that's not required. The local y-axis is defined by taking the cross product of the x vector, x-axis vector, and the vec xz vector. So you cross xz versus x, and you get the y vector. The right hand rule goes x cross y gives you z, z cross x gives you y, and so on. Okay, so that's the definition of the right hand rule. The local z axis is then found simply by taking the cross product of the y axis and the x axis vector. It's actually vx cross vy, and that gives you x cross y gives you this new z vector, which doesn't have to be parallel to that, it's actually orthogonal to all these other ones. The section is attached to the element such that the yz coordinate system used to specify the, spec the section corresponds to the yz axis of the element. So pretty much go through exactly what I defined above. Perfect. I think we've got that pretty clear. So let's look at just some graphics that are associated with that and then some examples. Here's the graphic. It's pretty much exactly what I have there. Here's your element goes from node i to node j. These are at right angles, and then these are right angles, but this is defined by whatever angle alpha you want. Sometimes, as I said, it's easier to actually go straight to the local z-axis or something perpendicular to the x-axis, but it's not necessary. And then this is about the rigid offsets that I'm not going to address right now, but it's literally just the geometry. But the, the most important thing about this concept here of the rigid offsets is that you're defining it in global coordinates just as the vec xz plane uh, vector here is in global coordinates, okay? Very, very important, which of course, because you couldn't really do it, define it any other way. So here's an example. I drew these a little bit, you know, rectangular so you can see, and just to have different kinds of geometries. Typically, I like to have my y-axis going upward and then in a y cross z is x, which means the x is coming out of the board. So it's actually I'm looking towards node i from node j if I look into the plane. Um, so this is helpful, but oftentimes it's just a lot more helpful to then sketch these out here. So let's take these element 1 and element 2. I've defined these, whether I define these in fiber sections or I've even just defined, you know, the ixx and izz. But I've gone in and defined them as rectangular elements here, and they're going to be lined up in a simple manner. So element one has actually the y-axis is in this direction, z-axis is in this direction, and therefore my x-axis is actually node i to j here. And I want to orient my other element to actually have the y-axis going to the right. Well, then let's just kind of look at it and see where is my vec x z. Because I have prismatic elements and they're placed here in orthogonal coordinates, it's pretty clear and simple in this case. If this is my z axis here, and here's my z axis, I might as well just use the z axis to define the coordinates. Well, look at it. It points upward, and then this one actually points into the board here. So if this is my global z axis, global x, and global y. If these are my x, y, and z coordinates, I can see here that this, and I'm showing it here again, this is a vector parallel 
to the z axis and it's also just in that plane. Remember, it doesn't really matter what the dimensions are, okay? Uh, all we really care about is the angle because it's just taking cross products and then it dumps any sort of uh, amplitude terms. So in this case, the local z axis is going upward and in this case, the local z axis is going into the plane. If you just transport these over here because this vector is parallel to that vector. So you don't have to define, you know, starting and end point you pretty much have to figure out what's what's the direction of that vector. So these are the vectors that we're actually defining. It's not the ones, you know, in our plane. Well, let's look at these. So for element one, this vector here is zero comma zero comma negative one. Yes, the negative matters. If you have relatively symmetric sections, it doesn't matter, but it's always important to just keep it straight. And in this case it would be zero, one, zero. So let's see if that's what they have here. Element 1, 0, 0, negative 1, that's what I have there. And then for element 2, I have 0, 1, 0, which is exactly what I have here. Perfect, and this is simple. So now let's go into the more complicated case of if you have a section that is rotated in its plane. As an example, I'm going to use the case here where I have a column that is actually rotated with respect to the plane of pretty much in your global coordinates. So let's look at this example right here and I'm gonna show it to you in space. So this is just a portal frame. So I've got the beam here and the two column elements. One of the columns is actually aligned with the plane and orthogonal to the plane of our frame here, while this other element here is actually at an angle. So it's almost like a rotated column in plan. In, well, actually this isn't, let's say in elevation or it's actually in 3D. In plan, this is what this would look like. So we're looking from above, you've got the Y axis coming out of the board, local X axis in this direction, and local Z axis. I always like to check Z cross X comes to Y, perfect. So I've got one column section that is perfectly aligned with my global coordinates, while I have a column section that is actually rotated. And let's say it's rotated an angle alpha. So if we actually look at the section itself, here's one section perfectly aligned, and then here's our other section. Now there's a couple of things that you can do with this. Two, two ways that you can go about defining this section and then defining, based on how you define your section, you can then decide how, well, that determines how you define your transformation. If you've got your section that's rectangular and therefore you know you compute your i or you define your fiber section based on these coordinates then you move forward in one direction now in this case here there's two things you can do one is you can work in this coordinate axis system therefore you got you know 112 bh cubed and this and that or if you want you might as well just use these as your local y and your local z so maybe let's use a different color. And if you do that, then there's no problem because your local Y is exactly aligned as it was over there. And so you can move forward and the geometry transformation, geometric transformations are easy. If you've actually just taken exactly the same section, so you don't want to define the section twice, you've defined it uh, in this case here with these properties, but then you're actually going to be aligning it you know, in this direction over here. So how do we manage that and how do we move forward? Well, it's pretty straightforward. You know, you have to know when you define your section what this angle here is. So here I've got 45 degrees, but let's say that this is an alpha. This is something, it, it, it's a given. You, you've got to have some idea of how this is rotated. It could be 45 degrees, 30 degrees or something. Well, then that's no big deal because what you do is you come here the, that alpha, you know, as we look into the plane, it's, it's repeated right here. So then all you have to do is look at, well, what are the components of this vector here in global coordinates? That's pretty straightforward here, right? So I'm again, I'm just moving over. I've taken the section out of there, but if you want, we can always sketch out the section, but I didn't put it in so you can see the angles. So we've got lots of different axes. Here's our global axes going to the right and down, and this is global X and global Z, perfectly in line with what I have there. Then I have one set of local coordinate axes, which is in this direction, up and to the left, and then I have the other coordinate axes, which is 
rotate in angle theta. Well, we bring in our little trigonometry. If you picked the light blue coordinate system, if you define your IY and IZ in those axes, then your local Z axis is right here and its values are minus one, zero, zero. If you actually have it aligned in this direction, this is your local Z axis. So I could define any plane in my local Z and X, but it's just easier to deal with my local Z axis. So if I look at it here, well, what are the components in global coordinates? In global coordinates, I've got a projection along global Z and the global X. So what's the component in the X? Well, it's negative cosine of alpha because it's a negative direction. In the Y direction, global Y, so this is global X, Y, and Z. Well, in the Y, it's out of the plane is zero. And in the Z, it goes along the global Z axis, so it's positive sine of alpha. So these are the values that you will put in depending on which element and what your orientation is. So this one would belong to this element while this one here Will belong to this element. So it's really not that complicated for these cases. If you've got beams that are oriented in space, you just need to sit down and, and just sketch this out and you see it. it. Interesting because as long as sometimes your i axes, your local x axes could be at an, at an angle. So let's say I have a roof, right? So here's my little house and this is actually in 3D space. Well, this x axis is at an angle. And therefore, the y, global y-axis is perpendicular to that. As long as I define my local z-axis to come out of the plane, right? So there's x, y, x, y cross z comes out of the plane. Well, this z-axis could be parallel to my global. This could be x, y, and then z is coming out of the plane. Well, for this element, even though the element is at an angle, the z-axis is perpendicular to that. It's not affected by that angle. And so it's always going to have the value of zero, zero, one, no matter what the pitch of your roof is. So I hope this helped and um, let me know if you have any questions. Thanks. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you learned something here. Please make sure you visit my website, sylviasbrainery.com, where you can find more information on courses and consulting and different types of trainings that you have available. Thank you. Bye-bye.